Shalom. Today we are going to make a linguistic investigation into who are the elect. We're going to see what we can learn about the elect from the way that the Bible uses those words in context. We're going to be looking at two different words, the Hebrew word bachir and the Greek word eklektos. Generally, as New Testament believers, we might tend to think that the elect only appear uh, in the New Testament, and that's the important part of it. But of course, uh, everything is founded in the Torah and in the Tanakh in the beginning. So that's where we're going to start. The word bachir has a root, bachar, which means to choose or elect. It's just the idea of picking something out. Genesis 13:11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So Lot was able to look at the different parts of the land, and he chose, he picked out part of the land that he wanted to live on. Psalm 135, verse 4, For Yahweh hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. So we see at some point the Lord made a choice of who he wanted to be his people. The word Bahir is a noun and it means chosen or elect. Isaiah 45 4 For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect I have even called thee by thy name I have surnamed thee though thou hast not known me. We see that uh, the father made a choice he picked out Israel. Isaiah 65, 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. The ones that he picks, the ones that he selects, that he chooses, they will inherit the land. In Hebrew, it's important to look at the cognate roots so we can get a broader understanding of what each word means. Cognate roots are words that are related to each other by linguistic rules of sound shift. So some of the cognate roots of bachar, bet chet resh, are bachor, bet kaf resh, and bakar, bet kuf resh. Bachor means the firstborn. Genesis 27:32. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. Now, of course, Jacob is lying here. He is not the firstborn, but we do know that Esau was born first, and he would have inherited the birthright except for events that happened afterwards. Psalm 78:51, And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength, in the tabernacles of Ham. During the plagues, it was the oldest child in each household that was slain. That's why it says that there was not a household that was unaffected by this plague. Every firstborn child was slain. Jeremiah 31, 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. So what we see here is that the firstborn rights can change from person to person. Ephraim was hardly the firstborn among those in Israel. In fact, he was not even of the 12 tribes. He was a, a grandson of the 12 tribes. But during events that took place over the course of time, the father has chosen Ephraim to be as the firstborn. He's going to have a certain inheritance and he's going to have certain rights and also certain obligations. The noun form of this word is Bechorah, Genesis 25:31. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. I want to be the one as the firstborn. I want to have those rights and obligations. First Chronicles 5.1 
Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So we see that a change in the birthright in the one who is supposedly picked or chosen, that that can change. Another word that comes from this root is Bikurim. It refers to the first fruits, Exodus 23:16. In the Feast of Harvest, now this is talking about the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. This festival in Hebrew has three names, Chag HaKatsir, the Festival of the Harvest, Chag HaBikurim, the Festival of the First Fruits, and Shavuot, the Festival of Weeks. These are all the same day. And the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Leviticus 23.17, um, in the Leviticus section is where it refers to the festival as Shavuot, as weeks. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of tenth, two tenth deals, they shall be a fine flour. They shall be taken bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahweh. The whole idea of the first fruits is a very interesting concept, which we have talked about elsewhere. The other root is bakar, bait kufresh, and it has several meanings. The initial, most important meaning is to seek out or to inquire. Leviticus, Leviticus 13, 36, Then the priest shall look on him, and behold, if the skull be spread in the skin, the priest shall not seek for yellow hair, he is unclean. In discovering the leper or the per person with the disease, if the person has an immediate obvious affliction, uh, symptom of the disease, the priest doesn't have to look further. He doesn't have to, to see, oh, is there a yellow hair? He already knows that the man is unclean. Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired, Yahweh, that I will seek after, that I might dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to inquire in his temple. So the first seek there is um, bakash. It has the idea of it to ask for something, to request something. When we say, for example, in modern Hebrew, please, we say, bavakasha, bavakasha, that means please, I'm asking for something. The bakar is the one that's inquire, to look into and to see uh, the beauty, the depth of uh, what is going on in the temple of Yahweh. Now, a word you're probably familiar with from this root is bokar, and it means mourning. Genesis 1, 5, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. How is morning connected to the idea of seeking out? There is a definition, an idea, that the first light of morning is when it is light enough to distinguish a man from a wo woman walking at so many paces away from you. That is when the morning starts. So it has to do with distinguishing or to seek out. Lamentations 3.22 It is of Yahweh's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So the morning is when we can begin to make a distinction, begin to look into a problem, and then make a decision based on what we have found out. Bakar also refers to herds of cattle or oxen, and these again have to be looked over and looked at to decide which one we will choose. Either we're going to choose it for an offering, maybe we're going to choose it to decide on how to breed our animals, but these concepts are all related. Genesis 33, 13. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them, one day all the flock will die. Isaiah 11:7. And the cow and the bear shall feed, 
their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So these are kind of an idea of certain animals that will go through a selection process. Now the Greek word for elect is eklektos, and uh, both in Hebrew and in Greek, I just use a modern pronunciation. I don't believe anybody really knows what the ancient pronunciation is, and so this is my choice. Matthew twenty sixteen. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few are chosen. So we're going to see in a minute that this word for elect, eklektos, is made up of two roots, a prefix ek, which means out of, and leho, which means to speak or to say. In other words, the one that is spoken for is the one that is chosen. The one that is called has the same prefix, ek, and the verb root is klesis, and you are probably familiar with the word ekklesia, and these are the ones who are called out. So we can see that it is possible to be called out and still not be chosen. So there are two different words, two different roots there. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, the ones that are spoken for, the ones that are chosen by Yahweh, will not ever be deceived. But things are going to get to a point where it seems like the people perhaps that we thought were the elect will be deceived. So we need to be attentive to that. First Peter 1 Peter 1.2 Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. There is a great discussion about predestination. We are not going into that discussion here. I will just tell you that what the Father knows and what the Father has done is not necessarily known to you. Our job is to spread the seed and not worry about who is going to receive it and who's not going to receive it, who is uh, reportedly saved unto forever and who is not. That is not your job. Your job is to do the best you can do. It says here that if you are elect, you are sanctified by the Spirit. What for? For obedience. And you just walk that walk and not worry about who the Father has chosen or why he has chosen them. Romans 11:7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. He's talking about Israel who is trying to work their way to the election. The election is by grace. And those who are elect have obtained it by grace and not by works. So the root uh, word for eclectos is eclegomai, Luke 10.42. But one good thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She made a choice to work in the kitchen or sit at Yeshua's feet. She spoke out what she wanted, and she made a choice. John 6.70 Yeshua answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? and one of you is a devil. So there are choices that are made for good and choices that are made for evil. John thirteen eighteen. I speak not of all of you, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Again, we don't know uh, what, why the choices are made, what the choices are for, we can only go about our business and do what is right in this world. The noun related to this word is eklogi, which is the noun election. Second Peter 1.10 Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Remember that who is the elect can change depending upon the events that fall out. Peter is encouraging the people. And if you look uh, further up, you will see what are the things that we need to do 
to make our election sure. So you might be elect, you might be chosen by grace, but there are still things that you need to do so that you don't fall. Mark 13.20, And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. So in looking over all the definitions of who are the elect, we find out that it falls into these four categories of pardes. And if you have not already studied what pardes is in terms of studying scripture, uh, you can look at the other videos that are done uh, about this subject. Basically, we have the plain meaning of the text, the uh, inferential meaning of the text, the devotional and the secret meaning of the text. The plain meaning of the text generally will be about the forefathers. The inference will be about Yeshua the Messiah. The drash, the, the meaning that we dig out and we look for is how we apply that to our lives. That's a devotional meaning. And then there is a hidden meaning for possibly the end time. The plain meaning of the idea of being chosen refers to the forefathers. Isaiah 14.1 For Yahweh will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Actually, that looks like a kind of a, a prophetic scripture there, doesn't it? Yahweh, that's his choice to choose the forefathers, the people of Israel, the people of Jacob. Romans 11.28 as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So he always had mercy on the people whom he has chosen down through the generations. Maybe it looks to us like they are not the chosen anymore. There's a lot of media hype about this right now, but it's not our decision. Yahweh made his choice and he can make his choice sure by what he does. We just need to go out and teach people about the Lord. Again, in the simple meaning, Acts 13.17, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. Romans 9.11, for the children, not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So the choosing is of God's choosing. It's not of our choosing. It's not of our understanding all the time. There is an election by grace. In the inference, the remez, the hint, we see in Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the nations, as we know about Yeshua. Luke 23, 35, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Messiah, the chosen of God, speaking directly of Yeshua. So this drosh meaning, the devotional meaning, is the meaning that we dig out to find out what does it mean to us as a people to be chosen. Deuteronomy 7, 6-8 For thou art a holy people unto Yahweh thy God. Yahweh thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, maybe um, even the least or the smallest of all people. But because Yahweh loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, that Yahweh brought you out of, with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. Know therefore that Yahweh is God, thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him 
and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. People who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The Exodus took place uh, maybe 3,500 years ago. Even if you take a very small number of 35 years for a generation, that's only a hundred generations ago. So I think that uh, he's still looking for people who keep his commandments. He repays them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hate him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So this is part of the devotional understanding. If you are chosen, therefore you will keep the commandments. In Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What does it mean to be holy and without blame? It means to be set apart and without uh, sin, without fault. In other words, we will be needing to keep the commandments to do those things. Colossians 3.12 Put on therefore as the elect of God. If you are chosen of God, then you will be ho holy and beloved. You will put on the bowels of mercies. In other words, mercy will just pervade you into your most deepest part. You should be kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Long-suffering is to be patient. Meekness is to be teachable. Concerning the foundational secret, hidden meaning for the end days. Isaiah 65, 22. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Talking about the uh, coming kingdom. Ezekiel 34, 12. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. The cloudy and dark day is the day of the Lord. It is a time of tribulation. And at that time, the Lord, as the shepherd, is going to come and find and seek out those whom he has chosen. In Leviticus 27.32, it says, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto Yahweh. And so there is a process of this seeking out, of reviewing the good and bad points to decide about the cattle, which ones will be the tithe. And it is also written in Ezekiel 20, 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. This is this searching out process. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And so in the future, there will be an examination to see whether you are, in fact, of the elect or not. Matthew 24:31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So whoever the elect are, whoever are the chosen, they will be gathered at that time. In Revelation 17:14, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called... Remember, these are people who are called out, the ecclesia, and the chosen, the eclectos, and also the faithful, the one who have kept his word and his commandments. I hope this has been somewhat useful to you. I think we still have a little time to wait before that day. In the meantime, while we are waiting, keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom. Keep the